Good morning, Shalom, Gracious. Good morning. Shalom, Shalom. I know that Gideon is highly talented, but I didn't know that you can write poem as well, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. Shalom to all Gracious, uh, both on site and online. We are currently on our family and sexuality series. And this weekend is the second installment of the series. And we will take a three weeks break from the series after today. And this is because of the various scheduled church events in the coming weeks like Father's Day, Grace Retreat, and Pentecost Sunday. And we will resume our family and sexuality series with, uh, with the third installment in the last weekend of June. All right, just in case you're following us on the series, we will resume on the last weekend of June. Now, last weekend itself, uh, Pastor Joey started the series. He shared on how we are created male and female to image God through our distinct gender identity. And after last weekend's service, a parent shared with me that the sermon came 10 years late for him. And, and because one of the children struggled with the issue of sexuality for many years. And when he shared with me, I was very moved. And, and, and I was very moved by his sharing his his, his struggle in the family. And, and, and church, the reason for having this sermon series is to help believers begin the process to reconcile our faith and sexuality. And I pray that our sermon series will not come too late for those who need to find God in their sexuality. Amen? Last weekend, we learned that Yahweh had created distinct male and female identities to image him. And our gender identity is derived from our biological sex. Now, building upon what we had covered last week, we will now move deeper into the topic of imaging God in our relationships. And the big idea for today is we are created to image God through godly relationships. And with that, I want to jump right now to Genesis 1 to revisit some very key verses right now. In Genesis 1, 26, it says this, Then God said, Let us make men in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And we can see from this verse that part of imaging God is to be God's representative on earth, to have dominion over everything. In verse 27, it says, So God created men in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. So from this verse, we can see that both males and females are God's images representing Him on earth. And we had examined this verse last weekend to understand that God's creation of human being was binary, male and female. And today we want to go further to see how their binary differences attracted them to each other. Because in Genesis 2 verse 18, it says this, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. And I will make him a helper fit for him. So the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Now it is obvious from the text that none of the created animals could be a suitable helper for Adam. And as, as explained last week, the word helper here in Hebrew refers to one who is stronger and not weaker. Because the same Hebrew word is also used in the scriptures to reference Yahweh as Israel's helper. So Yahweh did not create Eve to be inferior to Adam. Can all the sisters say amen? Can all the sisters say amen? amen. In other words, Eve was created with strengths that would be an 
excellent help to Adam. In verse 21, it says, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought him to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And in this passage, you can see that Adam was profoundly captivated by Eve when Yahweh presented her. She was not like the rest of the animals, but she was a person with whom Adam could touch, feel, relate, and communicate heart to heart. Adam called her woman because she was, she was different from him. And there were differences in physique, in emotions, and how they would relate to each other. So Adam and Eve were from the same human species, and yet distinctively different as male and female. And their binary gender differences attracted them to each other. And their attraction then led them to become one flesh as husband and wife within marriage. In verse 24, it says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Say with me, one flesh. It's one flesh in, in the spirit, in, 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 in their emotions, and, and also physically. Now, allow me to use this passage right now to address some fundamental issues in relationships. Now, we know from the scriptures that Yahweh has created male and female to be attracted to each other, right? It's very clear from scripture. Scripturally, we can see that. It is clear from the passage that Yahweh had designed male and female to be attracted to each other socially, emotionally, and physically. And we are created then to be attracted to the opposite sex to become one flesh, husband and wife in marriage. Now, the elephant in the room is this. Why do people have same-sex attraction, or we call SSA? Why do people have SSA even though it is not God's original design? Now, church, we all know, right, that, there's, that there are some Christians who have SSA too. And I've spoken to parents in our church, whose kids have SSA. And it's not an easy journey for them. I could feel the tension and the confusion of these families, especially the parents. And these parents often wonder if they have done something wrong in raising their kids. And some of us have wondered before, right, whether one is born with SSA. And we have seen from the Bible, we understand God has created male and female very clearly. But why is there SSA? So let's, let's right now turn to medical science for some insights. Now that we have spent time with the Bible, let's turn to medical science for some input all right, in this issue. Because in 2019, scientists concluded a genome-wide association that analyzed more than 477,000 individuals in the UK and the US. And this was the most extensive extensive study to date on sexual orientation and biology. And the researchers concluded there's no such thing as one having gay genes. And there is also other research on twins, given that twins are supposed to have almost identical genes. And if one of them were gay, then the other should also be gay since they share almost identical genes, right? However, researchers found that this is not to be so. Only a small percentage of the twins were both found to be gay. So scientists could only conclude that environmental factors play a part in causing one of the twins to be gay while the other did not turn out to be one. Therefore, based on various medical and scientific findings, 
There are no known causes for someone to have SSA. It is a confluence of factors such as biology, environment, childhood and adult experiences that causes one to have SSA. So yes, there are people with SSA, there are believers with SSA, but more importantly, church, what is our Christian response to this issue of one having SSA? And allow me to give you some simple response. And I hope that through this response, it will empower you to better deal with this issue. Firstly, we recognize that sin has a negative effect on humanity as a whole. You see, sin, ever since sin entered through Adam and Eve into humanity, sin has adversely affected human nature and how we express our sexuality. Human fallenness has caused, over time, has caused a small group of people to have an inclination to be attracted to the same sex. And this then leads me to my second response to this issue. Now, the inclination to be attracted to the same sex does not give one the right to sin against God and live a lifestyle against God's original intent for us. Now, this is equally true, isn't it, for those of us who are heterosexuals, those of us who are attracted to the opposite sex. Some of us may find it easy to be faithful to our spouse. No problem at all. But others of us must work very hard to remain faithful to their marriage because of their attraction to the opposite sex members, isn't it? So whether you are heterosexual or someone with SSA, we are tempted to go against God's ways because of the fallenness of humankind. And church, we struggle, isn't it? We struggle in some areas of our lives because of our human weaknesses. But that does not give us the right to sin against God because we have a greater tendency to sin in a particular area. And furthermore, we all know that temptation is not a sin. The temptation towards an area of weakness does not give us the right to sin in that area. Our Christian response should be the same for someone with SSA temptation, isn't it? And the whole concept of temptation is mentioned as well in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where it says that no temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. And God is faithful. And He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You see, this verse leads me to my final response to the issue of SSA. Like any area of sin, we must flee from the source of temptation. And for those with SSA, the best way forward is to please God through chastity in singleness. Chastity in singleness. Now, the word chastity conveys the meaning of purity. And the term chastity in singleness refers to one who chooses to maintain purity and holiness before God while remaining in the state of singleness. And some would even consider the chastity in singleness as a covenant commitment of purity between them and God. Now, some of you may be wondering right now, you said, Pastor, is is chastity in singleness even possible? Well, I want you to know that I've seen Christians with SSA who have chosen to live in singleness to please God and to reconcile their faith and sexual orientation. And I would highly recommend a book by Christopher Yuan, who is a gay and has chosen to live a godly life to please God. 
His book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, will be a blessing to those of us who desire to live to live a life of chastity and singleness. He's the one who coined the term chastity and singleness. To, to sum it up right now, my three responses to the issue of SSA is this. Sin that has entered through Adam and Eve has affected humans negatively with unwanted sexual temptations. Temptation in an area of weakness is not a right to sin in the area. And therefore, chastity in singleness is a good way, is a godly way to overcome SSA. And church, I hope that we do not see SSA differently. And we should treat it like just like any temptation that one would face. Now, hear me and hear me, hear me clearly. I'm not saying, I am not saying that we should condone homosexuality. I am saying that SSA must be seen in the same light as the other sexual sins mentioned in the Bible. And we need to create a safe space for those with SSA to share their feelings, their struggles, just like how we share our struggles with others without being judged negatively, isn't it? And just let's build a safe space to help one another live godly lives as God's images. Amen? Amen? Tell neighbor right now on your left and right. Tell neighbor right now. Let's build a safe space. And for those online time in the chat, build a safe space. Now, coming back to my earlier point, Yahweh has created male and female to be attracted to each other. And there are also many Bible verses that prohibit homosexuality. And let's visit some of them right now. Because in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, it says this, If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. So God's instruction is explicit, isn't it? That homosexuality is prohibited and it is an abomination to his eyes. It is prohibited because it changes God's original design for sexual desires between a male and a female. Now, some of you may say, but pastor, this is a very Old Testament, very Old, Old Testament verse. Uh, is it still relevant to us today? Now, that's a good question. And let's move to the New Testament right now to see if the same prohibition is found there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, it says that, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now bear in mind, this book, 1 Corinthians, is written to, to Christians, to believers. He says that, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, they will inherit the kingdom of God. He's saying that don't think of these people, this group of, this list of people, people who commit this sin, who live in it, will, be, will inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 11, as, as such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So verse, verses 9 and 10 put homosexuality as one of the areas in which those who practice it will not inherit God's kingdom. Now notice church, it is not the only area, but one of those listed here. And that's why I said earlier that we must not place homosexuality as the ultimate sin, but we must treat it the same as other sexual sins listed in the Bible. Verse 11 gives us hope, isn't it? Verse 11 gives us hope because the Corinthian church had people who once lived such lifestyles before knowing Christ, but they were transformed after becoming Christians and no longer live these sinful lives. So this passage here gives us strength, gives us a purpose to pursue 
godliness if we truly want to please God. Can somebody say amen? So the verses that we have read thus far only mention homosexuality among men. What about homosexuality among women? And let's go to Romans chapter 1, verse 24 now. In Romans 1, 24, it says, Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worship and serve the, cre the creature rather than the creator. And for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those, their country, to nature. Very clear, isn't it here? And it goes on to explain, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So the passage here highlights that homosexual relationships among males and females, all females, are displeasing to God. And these behaviors are consequences of people rejecting the Creator and satisfying the lust of their own hearts. And therefore, it's clear, isn't it? Both the Old and the New Testaments forbid sexual relationships between the same sex. However, church, we must also note that we cannot impose our Christian values and teachings on those who do not believe in Jesus Christ. There are many of them who do not believe in Jesus Christ and we cannot impose our values on them. And we are not here to argue with those who will not live what the Bible teaches. We're not here to do that. Our role as God's images is to help fellow Christians wrestling with their sexuality and are willing to live out a life pleasing to God no matter how difficult it may be. And we want to help those who believe in Jesus Christ and they are struggling. Our desire is to journey with those who need Christ's power for transformation. And church, these are our sons and daughters our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And some may even be sitting among us, among us right now. So tell a neighbor right now on your left and right, tell a neighbor, let's journey with those who need Christ. Let's journey with those who need Christ. Now coming back to the first passage in Genesis 2 that I started off today, I use this passage to address the issue of relationships and sexuality, especially for those with SSA. Now, let me address another pertinent issue arising from Genesis 2. Now, Genesis 2 is, is very definite about God's creation order of male and female, isn't it? And yet, there is a trend among teenagers today where some are experiencing the issue of gender dysphoria. This issue was even raised and addressed in our parliament by Minister Lawrence Wong. So what is gender dysphoria? Well, one expert defines gender dysphoria as the psychological term for the distress that some people feel when their internal sense of self doesn't match their biological sex. It is a psychological distress when one cannot identify with one's biological sex. Now, there are many issues surrounding gender dysphoria that we don't have time to, to dive into. Many factors have caused the rapid onset of gender dysphoria among teenagers. A few of them are, number one, the use of social media, where there is an unhealthy focus on one's body shape and size, causing depression and low self-esteem to some. Especially when you look at all the Instagram, right? Every, every one of them perfect body shape and size one. 
But after a while, he realized he had some problem with, with the young people watching this when they're trying to form their identity. And the second reason is youths are looking at TikTok and other social media to find their identity. They're having inputs about sexuality beyond the Bible, beyond what we talk about in our homes. They look to TikTok for information. And number three, peer pressure. Peer pressure and the cool factor of being a transgender, especially from the West that's pushing this right now. Now, let me emphasize that this is not an exhaustive, exhaustive list to the cause of rapid onset of gender dysphoria. But more importantly, what should we do as a faith community? With, and, and, and parents among us with children going through this, and don't be surprised if it happens in your family. Now, allow me right now to give three simple steps for us as a church and parents, and even grandparents. These steps can also be used for any sexuality issue that you may face with your kids or teenagers. The first step is to create a safe space for open conversation. Safe space for open conversation. If one of the, our kids shares that they are experiencing gender dysphoria, our first response is not to get upset with them. It's not like, why like that? Why are you having such feelings? Wrong, wrong, wrong. Wrong response. We should not respond that way. Our kids, when they share with us that they're experiencing some, some struggle with their gender, especially when they go to, if they tell you, I'm going through gender dysphoria, our first response is to not get upset with them, but to have a deeper conversation to understand their story. We must avoid denying their feelings and struggles by brushing them aside in our conversation with them. Don't tell them, that, ah, yeah, this will come and go, lah. don't worry, just, 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 just be yourself. Instead, we should be saying, tell me more. Tell me more about your feelings and what you're wrestling with. Tell me more. Tell me what you're really going through right now. And the moment, the moment we tell our kids to share more with us, parents, please remember, grandparents, we must ensure that we don't jump on them when they share their true feelings. We must absorb every shock internally and stay calm externally in the communication process. I know it's difficult for some of us. I know that, I know. But we must stay calm. Parents, remember, we want engagement and not disengagement with our kids. The other thing that we must be mindful of is that is the I know it all attitude when talking to our children. Be very careful, parents. Do not carry I know it all attitude when talking to, to them, especially with our teenagers. Even though it is true that some of us here, we eat salt more than our kids eat rice. It's true, I know that. But still, remember, it's not about salt and about rice. It's about engagement and not disengagement. And let's avoid talking down to them because such a matter will drive them further away from us. You see, church, the moment our children get the I know it all attitude from us, as parents, they will shut down from the conversation and they'll look for other sources that will hear them out. You see, parents, without meaningful and engaging conversations, our kids will go to the internet to find information from others. And these answers may not embrace Christian values and may eventually lead our kids further away from God and from us. And we don't want that. We must create a space for conversation to engage the next generation and to hear the real issues troubling them no matter how difficult it may be. And we want our loved ones to know that it is also difficult for us and we too, we are trying our best to understand, to love them, and to accept them. You must tell them, hey, it's difficult for me as well. Please be patient with me. I don't understand. It's difficult for me, but can you give me time? And we have to tell them. To let them know that you are struggling. At least your kids know that you are struggling and they say, okay, okay, mom, dad, I'll give you some time. Instead of coming hard on them. 
So with a safe space for conversation, we then move on to the second step. And the second step is to provide a life-giving and supportive community for those with SSA or gender dysphoria. This supportive community must first begin at home. It must begin with parents and be further reinforced by peer support within the church community. And if you need peer support for your children, please, please approach the relevant pastors who know you and your child. Let us know. And we want to provide as many avenues, as many avenues to support you as possible. And, and through these life-giving relationships and communities, our children can find acceptance and belonging within the faith community. You see, if our kids cannot find life-giving and supportive relationships at home and also in church, I can assure you they will look for them elsewhere. And we don't want that, isn't it? We want to engage them. We want to let them know that yes, in your in the process of struggle, we are here with you. And let's journey together. The third step is to learn more about the current issues and the language surrounding sexuality. Because the internet is a mess when it comes to giving information on gender and sexuality. And many online contents are created by, the, by activists from the Western country who promote beliefs and values on sexuality that are contrary to Christian values. And it's good to know some of the social media sources that your children are watching so you are aware of what they are learning and hearing. But more, in, more importantly, parents, grandparents, uncles and aunties, you need to get good Christian resources to equip you to engage your children. You need to. What we learned in the past, you see, parents, we, we must make some effort to know about the current language on sexuality to engage our kids better. What we know in the past may not be appropriate today for engagement with the next generation. What we understand in the past is, cannot be used to engage our kids today. And that's why I want to give you a good resource in Singapore. In Singapore itself, we do have an outstanding resource for sexuality and it is found on the True Love Is website. I highly encourage parents to engage the True Love Is website. This website is outstandingly filled with many real-life stories of people struggling with sexuality and how they overcome it. Testimonies, real-life stories, and explanation on sexuality. And if you need more resources, do write to us and we can point you to some very, very helpful ones. But start with this. But if you need more, let us know and we can send you. So let me summarize right now the steps again. Number one, create a safe space for open conversation. Create it. Provide then, a, after that, provide a life-giving and supportive community, beginning in the home and of course the church. And number three is that learn about the current issues and language surrounding sexuality because the current language is very different from what we have learned 20, 30 years ago. So we can see that we need the entire village, isn't it, church? We need the entire Grace Village to have godly relationship with each other and to raise our children in the ways of the Lord. And in concluding today's sharing, let me summarize our learning points. There are many learning points, and I put it in four. Firstly, we are created as male and females to image God, something that we have learned last week, reinforced this week. Secondly, the fallenness of humanity has caused some to struggle with sexuality and gender. We must acknowledge it. It is among us. And let's then walk this journey with those who are. Thirdly, we need to create a safe space to engage those struggling with their sexuality and gender. It begins at home and then the faith community. Fourthly, we do not condone what God has prohibited. That's for sure, isn't it? We do not compromise God's word. But we must offer grace and love to those who need Christ in their journey. And church, we are, we are doing all this because we are created to image God through godly relationships. Can somebody say amen? Come, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the authority of your word in family and sexuality. 
Enable Grace Assembly to be a safe community for those struggling to align their sexuality and gender to your word. Grant us today, O oh God, wisdom. Wisdom and grace to be upon all of us to help those who need Christ's love, who, need, who needs Christ's strength in their journey of finding their identity in you. So grant us wisdom and grace, O oh God, especially for all parents, grandparents, aunties and uncles among us. Help us, O oh God, as a village to help the next generation. We ask all of this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen, amen. Church, we just stand with me right now all over this place? I want to open the altars for prayer. Because for parents, for grandparents, for aunties and uncles among us, I'm speaking to all aunties and uncles, fathers, mothers, grandfather, grandmothers among us, and every spiritual parent among us. As long as you have influence over the next generation, you are a spiritual gatekeeper. A gatekeeper to what the next generation will receive and believe. And I want you to know that sexuality is just one of the many challenges that you will face with your children, with the next generation. There will be many, many more polarizing issues ahead of us. It will be coming. It's coming from the West and we must be ready as a family and as a church. Parents, grandparents and spiritual parents among us, you need God's wisdom to raise the next generation. It's not easy, I know. Some of us are even struggling right now, isn't it? We need God's wisdom to raise the next generation to fear God and not to be sucked into the world system. It's such a delicate balance, isn't it, parents? To be part of the world and yet not of the world. And today, I want to open the altars right now for all parents, for grandparents, for aunties and uncles. That if you need God's wisdom to raise the next generation, you say, God is... It's so tough. I know, I know there are challenges in the family right now. That's why I want to open the, the altar just for parents. Husband and wife can come together as well. Single moms and dads, you can come as well. You say, God, I need your wisdom. It is challenging raising the next generation. And today we're just handling only sexuality issues. There's so many more. And if you need wisdom from the Lord, you say, God, help me to raise the next generation. I don't know how, but I need your wisdom. God, I need you to guide me, to help me, to parent my kids. If that's your heart's cry, if, that, if you need prayer, I want you to come to the altar right now because we want to pray together with you as a community. So if you, wherever you are right now, if you need prayer to be a parent, if you need God's wisdom to raise the next generation, if you need God's anointing and wisdom to get, keep your family, your, your kids, you come right now because we want to pray for you as a church, as a team leads us right now. Hallelujah. So I open the altars, you come. Those who need prayer, you come right now quickly. Today, parents, this is for you. Grandparents, this is for you. Auntie, uncles, this is for you. We're here to pray. Make sure you are. You come right now quickly. Parents, you come and bring your kids before the Lord. Bring your grandchildren before the Lord. I say, come and lift them before you. Let's, let's worship the Lord right now. 